What do you do when your engine is making a terrible knocking sound? Is this rod knock or is it some other noise? And how do you figure it out? Well, that's what we're gonna do today because luckily my RB is making an awful racket. So we're gonna take this opportunity to take a dive into this engine to diagnose a knocking sound. It's gonna make me cry, potentially. I'm Zach and this is Money Pit, baby. Let's rip this thing open. Thanks to Car Insurance Comparison Site, The Zebra, for sponsoring this video. This is what a complete waste of time and money looks like. Don't be like us. Save time and money on your car insurance with The Zebra. The Zebra could save you up to $670 a year ensuring your car insurance isn't a money pit. <laughs> Get it? They compare quotes from top companies side by side so you can find the coverage and price that you want. All that means is more moolah in your pocket for whatever you want. Best of all, there's no spam calls or techie jargon. It's just unbiased, independent advice you can always trust to steer you in the right direction. Now, Job, why don't you take us in the right direction? We wasted all our money on this ad. Don't be like us. Save some money by comparing car insurance rates. Just go to thezebra.com slash money pit to see how much you can save. So a few months ago, right around Thanksgiving, I had this car out in the mountains. I was ripping around and it felt great. It was making good power. I had a huge smile on my face, making all the good noises. I ended up next to like a mountain basically and I could hear some knocking bouncing off the mountain back into my ears. And I thought, oh my God, I think that's my car. So I pulled over as soon as I could, hopped out, listened to it real quick, listened to it for long enough to realize Oh, that's, uh, that's a problem. That sounds like some real catastrophic issues. I do think that the noise is coming from the bottom end of the engine, the uh, rotating assembly, basically the crank, uh, connecting rods, pistons, that sort of end of the engine. But the question is, how do you figure out where the noise is coming from? What part of your engine is making the noise? Well, the first thing we need to do, unfortunately, is listen to it. So I'm gonna fire this thing up and we're gonna listen to it knock. Uh, just so you guys can kind of catalog what this sound is. And then when we figure out what exactly is making the noise, we'll know what that sound uh, is correlated to. So, I guess it's time to start this thing up. Okay. All right, that's enough, that's enough, that's enough. Well, uh, that's the first time I've started the car since the day that this happened, and it sounds just about as bad as I remember. Uh, so now we gotta figure out where that sound is coming from. But before we can do that, let's kind of talk about the options or the possibilities for where that noise could be coming from. To do that, let's go look at the spare Miata engine that I got over there. So one of the first options is what you call piston slap, and that is pretty much what it sounds like. It's the piston slapping around in the cylinder bore and smacking into the sides of the walls. Basically it happens if there's too much clearance in between the piston and the wall of the cylinder. Uh, it can happen due to wear or due to being put together poorly or machined poorly or all sorts of reasons. But the fact is, if it is happening, it can do a lot of damage and cause a lot of wear to your pistons and your block. So that's, uh, that's basically what piston slap is. To check for that, you kinda gotta get your eyeballs into the cylinders and ideally onto the sides of the pistons. I have a bore scope that will be able to stick down the spark plug holes and look around and see if there's any damage. Moving right along, let's flip this engine over and get the oil pan off of it. Okay, now let's talk about one of our other options for where this noise could be coming from. One of the most famous options, Rod Knock, or Rodney Knock, as he's known where I'm from. So first, let's talk about what Rod Knock even is. First off, uh, well, we gotta understand the connection between our crankshaft and our connecting rods. Basically, your crankshaft is connected to your pistons by the connecting rods. 
And your connecting rods are connected to your crankshaft by way of a bearing. So the clearance in your connecting rod bearing should be very small, a couple thousandths of an inch basically. Just enough clearance for a thin film of oil to separate all the parts and keep things moving nice and freely. Now, if that clearance isn't big enough or is too big, well, the oil can't do its job and you end up getting a bunch of wear and you end up with a bunch of excessive clearance because of all that wear and then you end up with rod knock. So uh, one way to test for rod knock is to take your oil pan off and wiggle all your connecting rod bearings. Now, all these feel pretty tight. There's always gonna be a little bit of uh, side to side play here, so that's okay. But in this direction, none of these feel loose, which this is not an engine that was supposed to have rod knock, so that makes sense. Okay, so there's our rod cap. Looks like the bearing stayed behind. <clears throat> okay, so and our bearing was left down here. So this looks fine. I mean, there is some wear, but this is, this is a pretty standard looking bearing. I mean, I'm sure if we take all these caps off, they're all gonna look pretty much the same. Let's do it. I'm actually kind of interested, just on a side note, to see what the bearings look like in this engine. So I'm gonna take them off. Basically same deal. Got a little bit of wear going on down there. Oh, and here's a good look at how these things get oiled. So you've got your big oiling hole in the uh, rod journal here, and that's where oil is forced through to you know, create that thin film of oil that everything rides on. So the oil comes from the oil pump and eventually out these holes in your crankshaft to force that oil pressure into these bearings and keep things happy and healthy. Uh, so oil pressure is obviously super important to keeping your engine happy and healthy. And the thing that really, in a lot of ways, determines oil pressure is your bearing clearance. So depending on this clearance, you'll have different oil pressures. If this clearance is very tight, then you're gonna have, well, you're generally gonna have really good oil pressure uh, because not as much oil can escape these holes, right? But if this tolerance is really loose, well, more oil can fall out this hole into your bearings and you know down back into your sump. So you'll have lower oil pressure. Now I bring that up because it's also kind of a decent way to know Know if you've got a rod knock issue. You can see, I mean, this thing is supposed to stay like this. It's supposed to be dropped in, this tang locates it, you bolt it in place, and it should never spin. The bearing should stay still. But if your tolerance is too tight or too big, or you've got uh, improper lubrication for any reason, and your crankshaft actually makes metal to metal contact with your bearings, it can spin them. Now, if it does spin the bearings, well, then you've obviously got problems, right? That's gonna cause rod knock. You know, maybe the bearings will double up on one side and one side will have no bearings. And then basically you've got a huge gap on one side of your rod journal. So that not only creates the noise, because that gap that you now have lets your crankshaft smash into your connecting rod, making that deep knocking sound. But another thing that happens there is that your oil pressure will drop because since you've completely removed a bearing from where it should be, it's no longer helping to control oil pressure. So if you spin a bearing, it can be because you lost oil pressure or you can lose oil pressure because you spun a bearing. Now, the 240 still has fantastic oil pressure, 100 PSI at startup. So I don't really think it's a bearing or at least a spun bearing for that reason, but it could be. Though I don't think so, but it could be. But I don't think so. But it could be. Without further ado, uh, now that I've kind of laid out some of the options, some of the possibilities for these knocking noises, let's dig into the 240 and try to figure out where my knocking noise is coming from. All right, so it's great to understand the potential possibilities of where this knocking sound could be coming from, but actually finding it is a little bit of a different story. The fact is you really got to get in there and see the issue with your eyes to know what it is. So that's what we're going to do. And uh, we're going to try to do this in, uh, in an order that makes sense, you know, try to go from easiest to hardest. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is real simple. I'm just going to check to make sure this thing is still in time. Uh, when I just started it and we were listening to the noise, I noticed that my timing belt is pretty loose. And that could potentially mean that this is a valve train issue. Uh, I don't think that's the case, but it's incredibly easy to check. To do that, I just got a socket that I'm going to stick on my uh, crank pulley here, and I'm going to turn it until our top dead center mark on the crank uh, lines up with our top dead center mark on the timing cover, and then our timing marks on our cam gears should also line up with our timing marks on our timing cover. So, just going to spin this thing till we get to top dead center. 
All right, so now that I have this all lined up and I've got my crank pulley at TDC, uh, we can check our timing marks. And once we check them, we can see that we are in time. So we haven't jumped time. That is good news. Uh, we still have a super loose timing belt, so that's going to need addressed, but uh, that's no big deal. The next easiest thing to do is going to be to pull the spark plugs out and gander down into our holes. Okay, so I've been pulling out the spark plugs, pulling out the last one right now, and obviously as I pull them out, uh, I've been inspecting them to make sure that they don't look uh, awful or like there's any signs of damage or anything like that. Maybe a little dark, like uh, running a little rich, but they look fine really. Uh, so, problem doesn't lie with these, but now that we've got all the spark plugs out of the way, we can look down into the cylinders. This is my bore scope. Uh, I'm actually ogling over it. This is the first time I've used this one. Uh, so this just sends out a Wi-Fi signal and then sends the signal right to my phone. So it's really simple. It's just this and my phone, an app you download. So it's a really handy tool to have around and uh, should make poking around in these cylinders a lot easier. So let's, uh, let's go jam this down in my holes. I'm gonna turn the crank so that uh, whatever cylinder we're working in, the piston is at bottom dead center so we can see everything. And uh, basically I'm just gonna look around, look for any signs of damage, look for anything that looks out of place, look for any blown holes in the sides of anything. Yeah, I mean really that's it. We're just looking for anything that looks bad. So, let's look. Okay, so right here I can see a little bit of wear. You can kind of see some striping, but that doesn't look very bad. That's certainly not enough to make any noise. And you can see cross hatching, and I can still see some vertical wear, which isn't great, but it doesn't look terrible. So I'm gonna keep doing this uh, through all the cylinders. I'm gonna just be looking around, keeping my eyes peeled for any damage. And if I find anything, you'll be the first to know. All right, Doc, give it to me straight. Well, we've definitely got some wear. It, uh, it doesn't look great. Okay, so after sticking the camera in all my cylinders, uh, we've got visible wear in uh, pretty much all the cylinders, concerningly visible wear in at least two of them. So that alone is enough for me to take this thing out and rebuild it. But we're gonna keep poking around. Uh, we're gonna take the oil pan off and see if there's anything weird going on down there. Okay, so now we got the car up in the air. Uh, so now I'm gonna drain the oil and we're gonna take a look at the oil as it comes out, see if there's any chunks of metal in it. I do see some reflection in the oil, like some little tiny pieces of glitter. Uh, not what you want, because those are usually pieces of uh, your engine. All right, so now that we've got all the oil out of the pan, I'm just gonna take the pan off so we can get a look at what's going on inside of there. Okay, so to get the oil pan out, I need more room in between the bottom of the engine and the subframe. So I'm gonna support the engine with the support bar, and uh, then I'm gonna disconnect the engine from the engine mounts, and then I can either raise the engine up with this bar by cranking up that handle, or I can lower the subframe. You just have to disconnect the stuff that connects the subframe to the car. Uh, so when I bring down the subframe, I'm also gonna bring down the front suspension brakes. So I have to disconnect the coilovers from the strut towers. And then we're ready to loosen the subframe hardware and drop this puppy down. And now the subframe should move and the engine should stay still. Okay, now before we can go toying around, I'm gonna put this uh, subframe back up. Okay, now that that is safely suspended, first let's look in the oil pan and see if there's any junk or debris in there, and then we'll uh, poke around in there. It doesn't feel nice in there. Well, those little gold pieces, that looks like bearing bits to me. <laughs> oh. It's okay. It's just an engine. It's just an engine parts. Well, the news is not good. <laughs> All right, well, so we definitely have some, uh, well, it looks like bearing particles in our oil pan. So 
let's go uh, touch the bearing spots. Let's go see if uh, we've got any loose connecting rods and uh, figure out what the hell we're gonna do. Now what we're gonna do is uh, basically just kind of try to wiggle the bottoms of all of our connecting rods and see if any of them have uh, apparent play. And they might not, I might not be able to, to get too much play out of them. Uh, so we'll probably ultimately take the caps off. But first thing we're gonna do is just spin it around, give all these a good wiggle. Oh, two feels aight. Oh, three feels aight. Oh, yeah, I couldn't see it. Oh, four feels aight. Okay. Oh, five feels okay. Oh, baby, and it is lucky number six. You see it? Nice and silvery? Yeah. Good. That's how they all look, and like how they should. And number six comes around, Ooh, yeah. you can see a little hot spot. Looks like we had some heat going on on the inside of that thing there, so I'm gonna guess that that's where my bearing issue is. So I'm gonna pop that puppy off and take a gander. There she comes. Are they bearing that high up? Yep, and the other one's halfway down and around the other way, and I can see a chunk of gold flake coming. <laughs> Got oil oh, in my ear. <laughs> yeah, that's what I get. Well, <sighs> ow. That's not how she's supposed to be. Uh, bearing seems to have spun. So number six uh, is our problem. You can see a hot spot. You can see wear on the back side of the bearing. Uh, the bearing is supposed to stay still in the connecting rod uh, and the crank is supposed to spin in it. Not, not any of this type of action. And you can see we've got some of that going on. So uh, I think we found our smoking gun. Uh, number six was making the noises. Uh, and also we've got some pretty concerning cylinder wear that I found in all of the holes. So yeah, we gotta take the engine out. We gotta take it all apart. We gotta take inventory, take stock of what kind of shape everything's in. Then we need to order some new parts, find a machine shop probably, and then put it all back together. No big deal. <laughs> uh, yeah, no big deal. We have the tools. It's just car parts. Um, it's very sad. I'm crying on the inside, but it's gonna be okay. We can rebuild it. We can make it better. On that note, I guess uh, we've got a few more episodes to make. So thank you guys for checking this one out. I hope you had a good time. I had a terrible time, so please subscribe to the channel to make it all worth it. And follow me on Instagram at Zach Job and follow Donut at Donut Media. And I'll see you guys next week. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Turbos are awesome, but they don't even have a mascot which is downright not awesome. So we decided to take matters into our own hands and give turbos the representation that they deserve. Introducing Spinny Boy, the official, unofficial mascots of turbos and the people who love them. Stu's too hey! He'll speed past any foe. Watch that turbo! Go, go, go! Here to help and bring you joy. Watch our world in Spinny Boy! Spinny Boy is a sentient turbocharger, 100% dedicated to providing power to anyone who needs him. He's cute, but he's dangerous, just like us. Oh, that's where I put this thing. To commemorate the birth of our beautiful new friend, we put him on a shirt. It's Stu Stu Stupid Soft and Stu Stu Stupid Comfortable. Congratulations, little guy. It took Nolan two years to get his own shirt. Right now, Spinny Boy is the official, unofficial mascot of Turbos and the people who love them. But I honestly believe if we work together, we can make him the official, official mascot of Turbos and Turbo Enthusiasts. We've done this before, guys. Remember about horses? That didn't mean anything before. We can do it again. Let's ride. If you can, get a shirt to show your support and your love for Spinny Boy. And if you don't buy a shirt, I don't really care. Post a picture of your own Turbo with hashtag Spinny Boy. I want to make him a star. I love this little guy. If you want a shirt, you can get him at DonutMedia.com. I love you. Now back to the show. Stu, Stu, hey! He'll speed past any 